Welcome, Ted Turner. Thank you. Well, this is a, uh, I'm really touched by seeing such a big crowd, you know. It's, thank, thank you. Um, we're going to ha mostly have question and answers, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of my background, how I got interested in, uh, in Russia. When I was a, a boy uh, growing up in the United States, I was very concerned. They, used to show movies of atomic bombs going off, and, uh, and, 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 and I was really worried. I, I, I watched the news on TV and read the newspapers, and I was worried about, uh, the, it was the Soviet Union then, I was worried about, you know, a war between the Soviet Union and the United States, and, and particularly a war that might go nuclear and, and, and kill everybody. And, and just stop. So when I got a little bit older and could afford to come over here, I came over. And uh, I think 1982 was my first first trip over. And I just started uh, CNN, so I was in the news business. And I wanted to use my news media to uh, try and see if there was any way that I could bring our countries better, closer together, so that we wouldn't have a war. Because if you make friends, if you if you only have just one friend in another country, you don't want to go to war with that country. You know, because nobody wants to go to war with their friends. I mean, it's getting to a point now, too, but I really believe that people aren't going to, go to want to go to war at all. I mean, the only ones that are doing it, other than the United States and Afghanistan, uh, I don't know how much longer we'll be there. Did you see Abdullah Abdullah this morning? I was watching the news. When I was working out, and Abdullah Abdullah has withdrawn from running against uh, the president in Afghanistan. What a mess that place is. We should have left that, let you have Afghanistan. In fact, maybe before I leave this afternoon, would, would, would you take Afghanistan if I give it to you? No. <laughs> I can't give it to you, but uh, it's yours if you want it. Anyway, uh, so I came over and we, 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 we uh, the, the, the boycott in the Olympics really concerned me because when you're not even playing sports together, uh, this is at the, the boycott of the uh, Moscow Olympics that President Jimmy Carter did in 1980. And then what happened right after that is uh, the next Olympics was in Los Angeles in 1984 and the Russians didn't go either. So. We had gone eight years without uh, our, our international uh, Olympic teams competing with one another. And sports is so important over here and in the United States, particularly Olympic sports. And it, it was just terrible. So with, 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 I had friends in uh, Russian television and the government and in the sports committee. And we got together with the three of them and we made a partnership to uh, put on the games, and we would do the first one. This was back in uh, 1984, 85, and we would do the first one uh, in, uh, in Moscow because you already had all the, uh, all the venues ready because you'd already had the, had the Olympics here in 1980. And we did, and we never got into an argument. I mean, here I was a capitalist uh, company, and, and my partners was the government of the, of the Soviet Union. And uh, we, we, we thought if, if we ever had a disagreement about things, since it was 50-50, that we decided we would uh, go to arbitration in Sweden. There's an international arbitration committee in Sweden. And we put that in the contract that we signed that, uh, that we would go and let, let them decide if we couldn't agree. So we wouldn't get into. Uh, an impossible situation where we couldn't function. So, but we never had to go. We never, we never had uh, an argument. And, and, and we had, and the other thing is back, then, then the next games, the first one was in Moscow in uh, 1984, I think it was, 86, 84. And then the next one was in Seattle. And then the third one was in 1990, I think, or 92, in St. Petersburg. And guess who 
where I met then. Vladimir Putin was the vice mayor of St. Petersburg. <laughs> he was. And mayor, the mayor was Mayor Sobchak, who was a wonderful man and became a good friend. He's passed away since then. But when, uh, and I had to come over to see how the, uh, the, the, the venues were being fixed up, the swimming pool and the track and uh, the Olympic Stadium and so forth, and, and St. Petersburg and all the other, the other venues. So Mayor Sobchak would usually meet me at the airport and, t and t drive me into town and show me things himself. But uh, one time, he couldn't make it. So he sent Putin to, uh, to come to the airport and meet me. And uh, of course, I didn't know he was going to be president. He said, little, little guy. You know <laughs> <laughs> He's a tough little guy, you know, <laughs> karate. So, so anyway, that was the night. That was the night, that afternoon, that, that his wife was in an automobile accident. And he got a radio call that his wife had had an accident. And, and, and I said, is she, she in an accident? I said, we should go to the hospital. And he said, no, no, we've got to go on with it. I said, and, and, and I said, absolutely not. I said, he said, my job is to is take you to dinner tonight. And I said, that may be your job, but we're going to go to dinner by ourselves. You're going to the hospital to see your wife. And that's it. And he said, OK, I will. And, and it turned out she was very badly hurt. She was OK. But uh, so he really appreciated that. And the moral of that story is be nice to the man that meets you at the airport, because later he may become president of the country. <laughs> That's right. That was one cute little story. And, and another one, another one, uh, we, we were went hunting it was like back in the Soviet. We went down to the Caucasus to hunt the sheep up in the mountains, because I like to hunt. And uh, I also like to, when I would come over here, I would try and get out in the countryside and get, just get to meet the people, as well as meet the people in the city and the students like we're doing, like we're doing now. And, and we stayed in a little cabin uh, up on the side of the mountain. And uh, a, a young man came with us, and he was a KGB agent. I mean, it wasn't hard to tell, and, uh, but he was very nice. And, and, and uh, he, he, he was asking me, he said, Ted, why are you being so friendly to us? What, what, you know, with the Goodwill Games and all this. He said, you just come over here and just one idea after another about what our countries could do together and TV and so forth. And he said, he said are you crazy or are we crazy? I mean, something, something's wrong here because Americans don't like us like you do. What's, you know, after all, we've got a Cold War going on. You know, it, we should all be grumpy. I said, no, we shouldn't be grumpy. I said, here's the reason, Dimitri. I said, Dimitri, I said, I love my country and I love my family. And I said, uh, I've studied this situation real carefully and I'm really worried about the possibility of nuclear war and, and, and everybody getting killed on your side and my side. And I said, so. I'm coming over here to make friends with you and do everything I can to make friends with the Russian people on behalf of the United States so that your children will be safe and my children will be safe and our countries will be safe because I want to be your friend and, and, and I want to do it to make peace between us. And he said, you know, that really makes sense. And he went back and, uh, and told uh, the people in Moscow and from then on, Things went even even uh, easier easier for us, uh, but as far as uh, our relations were concerned, and I'm still concerned. That's one reason I'm here today. Is do you know the war's been over for 12 years? I mean, and 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 uh, President Obama is not going to put the missiles in uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Thankfully, that was a dumb thing to do. And I wanted, I wanted, I said back, I was going around the colleges of the United States, and when, when the Berlin Wall came down, I said to uh, the students and everyone I could chance, I said, we should invite Russia to join NATO. We should have had, but what, then we don't need NATO anymore. We, we should only have one security group, I think, other than the United Nations in, in the world. And then you don't have, uh, you can't split into, uh, into two groups, but we still have our nuclear weapons 
on hair trigger alert pointed at each other because they haven't figured out how to take them apart. And the only real answer, I think, and I'm working on this, is I think we should get rid of all nuclear weapons, all of us together, including North Korea, Iran. How can the United States and Russia look at the Iranians in the eye and say, you can't have three nuclear weapons when we have 20,000? You know, we've got to play by the same rules in this world. Either we all have them or nobody has them. And obviously, we don't want, you know, India and Pakistan have gotten them in the last, uh, in the last few years, the last 10 or 15 years. Nuclear proliferation is going to be with us. And the more countries that have them, the more bombs there are, the more chance there is one will get into the hands of a terrorist, a Chechen, or, or, or uh, somebody from Pakistan, it, some government that's not as stable as, uh, as ours. And I, I really think we, we should uh, get rid of them. And I, they, they, that doesn't mean that somebody couldn't build them later on. But I think if we ever do get rid of them, we won't want to build them again. Because why do we want to blow ourselves up? You know. Moscow is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Who would want to drop a bomb on it? You know, I, I mean, I would defend. I, I'll, I'll help you defend if anybody wants to drop a bomb. Nobody's going to drop a bomb on any of my cities. I just got here from Beijing yesterday, and I don't want Be Beijing bombed. I don't want. I don't want bombs dropped anywhere. I don't like bombs. And, <laughs> And people that have been, and, and you don't teach anybody something by bombing them, you teach them by sending them to school, you know, or sending them to college. That's what we should be doing. Anyway, we're going to have some questions and uh, answers, but those are, those are the things that, uh, that uh, get, explain a little bit of my, my background here. And it's great to be back and really good to uh, see all of, all of you. And just as you grow older, just remember when you get to be in a position of uh, authority here, you know, if the weapons haven't, if we haven't gotten rid of the nuclear weapons by then, go ahead and you work on it too and give me a hand. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so let me first start. Uh, you, as the president of UN Foundation, can you, could you, would you so please to... I'm the chairman, I'm not the chairman. president. Okay, chairman. <laughs> and uh, would you so please to give us a vision of the United Nations reform? Uh, but now you see most, uh, we see new tendency that politicians start to speak, not UN reform, but UN development for the better uh, efficiency and uh, relevance. So give us your vision for the United Nations reform or development. Well, you know, I, I, I think that they could uh, re reform a little bit. Anything can always be better. And uh, the United Nations is, is including that. I really like the United Nations just the way they are, but they could be a little, little bit better. I think personally uh, that that they ought to expand the, secu the Security Council uh, from five to ten, ten members and make it more, uh, more democratic and uh, more representative. But I think they ought to have a representative from uh, Africa. I think they ought to have a representative from South America. I think that they ought to have uh, just five, five members instead of ten and then maybe do away with the veto. Uh, I, the veto one country shouldn't be able to stop everything else that everybody else is, in, in, in my opinion. But uh, their role in development, certainly, uh, the other thing you mentioned, I, I think we have an obligation, uh, the, the wealthy countries of the world, to help those less fortunate than, our, than ourselves, the really poorest people, a billion people, or over a billion, a billion, 100 million people go to bed hungry almost every night. But that's a, 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 a problem of, uh, of overpopulation. When I was born, there were only 2 billion people in the world in 1938. And uh, now there's uh, almost 7 billion people, three and a half times as many people in, um, in, 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 in 70 years. 
That's, uh, that's, that's an awful lot. We just can't keep growing like that. We can't. I just uh, got, got here from China, and I was there for six days, and th th there's hardly room to turn around in China. It's, uh, there's so many, so many people there. Uh, you, can, you can see it. And th then the other thing is, the more of us there are, the more stuff we're using, the more electricity and uh, the more gasoline. I, I also am working on, with, with the United Nations and with others, working to try and uh, combat uh, global climate change, because uh, that, that, that's really going to mess us up if we don't do it. And it's the, the days of fossil fuel are over. Uh, we need to phase it out and go to sun, sun, sun power and, uh, and wind power and, and maybe geothermal. We need to do more research there. We're going to learn a lot uh, by doing more research and development uh, in the uh, energy area. But, you know, when's the last time you used a telephone booth? That's right. You did, that's been a, been a long time. How about a VCR? Everything's DVD. When's the last time you played a music on tape? It's, everything's on uh, the discs now. So if, we, if the technology and, and, and really, Coal burning coal goes back 200 years. I mean, we've been doing that since the beginning of it, and it's time time to say goodbye to it uh, and do it the, the better, better, cleaner, cleaner way. And and it, it won't really hurt Russia with your your big oil reserves and your natural gas reserves. The natural gas is uh, what we need to use as the transition fuel because it's so much cleaner than coal or or oil. We should use use our natural gas. Unfortunately, most countries have natural gas. Not many have oil. Uh, but there's still going to be plenty of use for oil for the next 10, 20 years anyway uh, because of transportation, airlines, and, uh, and just it's going to take, take time and effort to, to, to build uh, new gas burning, gas burning plants and solar and wind uh, power plants to replace the uh, coal plants first. Uh, they need to be replaced first. So we got plenty, plenty to, uh, to do, and I don't think it will hurt the economies of uh, most countries. It'll be good because it'll give people jobs uh, working in the clean tech area, and it'll, our health will be better. In the United States, uh, asthma, you know, the children get uh, having trouble breathing is up 100 percent, and it's all because of the coal-burning uh, power plants that, uh, that make, make make your health bad. If we just, just when we, you know how nice it is on a clear, clear day when the wind blows the, blows the uh, smog out and, uh, or when you go, go out into the countryside far away from the cities and, and breathe fresh air, it's so, so much healthier, healthier for us. And we need, we need to, we need to do that uh, too. So we need to, we need to work on development with the UN and there's nothing wrong with uh, re reform too. That's like, Glass not and perestroika, you know, reform and then development, right? Thank you a lot. Uh, so now, questions from the floor. Good morning, Mr. Turner. My no, name call is... me Ted. Okay, uh, good morning, Ted. Uh, <laughs> uh, Uh, my name is Vladislav. I'm a student of uh, the Faculty of International Economic Relations, and I have a question from my independent internet community called My Kremlin. So, uh, what differences between setting up, maintaining mass media business in the United States and in Russia do you see? And do you see any curbs on free speech, any barriers in the Russian mass media? Thank you. Thank you. I I'm hard of hearing, so I'm going to have Gavin tell me what the... <laughs> it will be a right, a right translation. <laughs> so, what did they Okay, okay. All right. So we're not gonna, it's not going to last very long anyway. <laughs> Mass media in Russia. I, you know, I, I haven't been here so much lately. Uh, but I uh, just uh, I wouldn't mind having a show of hands because you would be much better at, to let me know. I, do you think that we have freedom of the press in Russia? How many think we have freedom of the press? Raise your hand. How many think we don't have freedom of the press? Raise your hand. Okay. 
That tells you. I go along with the majority. But I don't really know what the answer is. I, 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 I obviously am a believer in freedom of the press, you know, ideally. But there's a lot of countries that don't have freedom of the press. And um, their organizations and people that uh, try to encourage that, and I'm, I'm one of them, although it's not my, my top priority because I'd, I'd rather get rid of the bombs first. Okay. I agree. Good morning, Ted. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I don't want to ask a political question. It's just a personal question. Well, we all here know that you're a millennial, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell us what is the basement of, uh, of your success? What three qualities uh, should, um, what three qualities should have person to be su successful? Okay. Thank you. I, the, the, one of the main reasons I came over here today is that uh, on tomorrow, uh, my autobiography is being published in Russian. It's been published, and, and it'll go on sale tomorrow, and I tell all that in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's really, you'll see when you read the book, it's too long to just tell in, 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 a, in a few lines. Well, but, but, but I do get asked that question a lot at colleges, and, I, and, and what I usually do to answer the question, how do you get to be rich, I said, early to bed, early to rise, work like hell, and advertise. <laughs> don't, don't forget to introduce yourself. Good morning, Ted. Uh, Faculty of International Economic Relations, first course. Well, I want to ask you, you as a, mem as a chairman in the UN, what methods are going to introduce the UN to stop the war conflicts quicker than we have seen it in the previous 10 years? And what methods are going to introduce to prevent the countries with no stable government from developing the nuclear program? Well, Thank you. The, the, the way we'll stop the uh, unstable governments from developing nuclear program is if for nobody else to have, have the weapons. That, 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 even everybody will agree with that. Everybody will agree with that. The reason that Iran wants nuclear weapons in North Korea is because we've got them. And they see us uh, as bullying them if they, if they don't. Although, you know, thank God no one has given anyone an ultimatum yet since World War II. And we didn't even give Japan an ultimatum. We didn't give them a chance. We just bombed them first and then asked them to surrender afterwards. But uh, a lot of countries wouldn't surrender. For instance, in the Vietnam War, I've studied that very carefully. If the United, President of the United States had called the President of North Vietnam and said, we're sick of this war and we're going to end it. Now, if you don't surrender by next Friday at noon, we're going to hit you with everything we've got. We're going to drop 100 nuclear weapons on every city in North Vietnam. We're going to blow you all off the face of the earth. And Ho Chi Minh would have told them. He said, bring them on. Then what do we do? Do we actually do it? Well, first of all, nuclear weapons have radioactive poisoning. Remember Chernobyl? <laughs> of course you remember Chernobyl. And, uh, and what it does. Is, is it poisons everything around. You know, it, it blows, the wind blows the radioactive dust hundreds of miles down, downstream and kills everything in the way. I mean, so if you drop a bomb in Pakistan, a nuclear bomb, then the wind blows it over India. They, so India is killing themselves if they bought, the, the damn things are just no good. They're not efficient. That's why a gun is really, if you want to kill somebody, shoot them with a pistol. You know, that way you don't do any collateral damage. You don't kill their mother or grandfather, you know, and you don't kill their children. You just kill them. But I don't even want to do that, to tell you the truth. I don't carry a gun, and uh, I don't want one, except for hunting, okay? And not people. You know, we don't hunt people. Now, what was the other part of the question? Uh, what, are going? 
What methods are going to introduce the UN to stop the war conflicts? For especially to stop them quicker. Quicker, yes. Well, all we would have to do is, uh, is, is increase the budget for peacekeeping. We can cut, I think we should cut the, our individual, in individual military budgets back. Certainly the United States should. We're spending way too much. And uh, route the money through the United Nations for peacekeeping and let, let them take care of things like Darfur, Darfur. Let the UN do it. And all we have to do is vote to do it and, and fund it and let them pay for it. But they get a better deal anyway. It costs uh, 20 times as much to put an American soldier in the field as it does a Rwandan or a Nigerian soldier, which is a Pakistani soldier that, that the UN u uses. So, I mean, we save a lot of money because Pakistanis will serve in the service for a lot less than Russians or Americans will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Natalia. I'm studying journalism there. Um, my question is, as far as I know, it was your idea to color old black and white films. Uh, but some people criticize it. Uh, what do you think about this criticism? And what do you think about the development of film coloring? Thank you. What do I think about the coloring of old black and white movies? I was the first one to do it. I like color better than black and white. Black and white is kind of like coal burning plants, old fashioned, time to get rid of it and time to get color. I want lots of color in my life. Thank you very much. Olim, uh, legal studies master student. I'd like to thank you for coming here and we really enjoy your visit here. Uh, enjoy Moscow, enjoy Russia and my question is, what is tolerance for you? What can you tolerate and what can, can't you tolerate? <laughs> well, I, I, I really like to be around smart people. <laughs> and I can tolerate smart people, but I don't really particularly like to be around dumb people. Like our president was, George Bush. We had... <laughs> Now we've got a smart president, thank God. And, and I think, I think uh, well, Medved is the president, and I know Putin's secretary of state anyway, but I, I think Putin's real smart. I really do. I like him. Always have. Ever since he picked me up at the airport. <laughs> okay? Yeah, thank you for your sincere and open answer and reply. Enjoy Moscow once a time. Let me, let me just ask you, because I, when I came in this morning, when I came in through the door, there were some students out there smoking. How many of y'all smoke? Come on, raise your hand. Because I, one of, that's one of the things that I also am fighting is smoking. Smoking is bad for your health. It takes, it takes an average of 20 years 20 years off your life, and it makes you sick. You start getting sick at 40 instead of 60. And, and it, my father, he killed himself because he was smoking and he got emphysema. You know, that is where you can't breathe. And he shot himself at 53. And that really made me mad because I love my father. And uh, if, if, if you're a young man, you might have a son or daughter and if they see you smoke, they might smoke too. But even, you, you want to live a long time to see them graduate from college and get married and be a grandfather. You, you must smoke, young man, don't you? Because you were the one that said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if I could quit, and I quit years ago, you can quit too. And you'll feel better, really. Yeah, you will. Good morning, Tad. Uh, another question from internet community, Mike Kremlin. Uh, what do you think? Uh, can uh, international organizations like UN or International uh, Monetary Fund uh, work effectively in the interests of the entire world while they are primarily funded by the U.S.? Yes. <laughs> and how, how is it possible if, like... And, and, you know, the U.S. is actually funding a smaller portion of the U.N.'s dues today than it was 10 years ago. But the, the U.S. is trying to cut back on, 
the U.S. is almost broke. I mean, you know, you can be rich and be broke, or, or you can be rich one day and broke the next. I mean, I, I can remember that. That almost happened to me. I was worth billions. And, I, and, and then we merged with AOL, and I just watched, watched my money just — but fortunately, I'd given a lot of it away because I would have lost it anyway. So money and riches and health and all these things don't last forever a lot of times. You've got to be lucky, and, and you've got to work hard. But, but never think, just because you've got some money today, like if you've got 100 rubles, if you go spend it, you don't have it anymore, right? So money can come and go. So you can't uh, — and you have to be able to li keep living if you lose your money. Like I, like I lost most of mine. I've still got enough where I can afford one small airplane. But uh, it sure is nice, you know, particularly flying across Siberia, you know, to have your own plane. You can stop anywhere you want to. Okay? Good morning, Mr. Ted. My name is Veronica Borakina, and I'm a third-year student of the Institute of International Relations. My question is pretty simple. Um, as far as any human being in this world, I would like just to know your point of view on this question as uh, what's, the the, what's the most important thing in this life? Thank you. The most, the, most important thing, the most important thing in your life, I think, is probably your health. Because if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And then after that, having a good husband or a good wife. And can I ask you another question, please? Do you believe that um, we can make this world better? I mean, I mean, actually better. Yes, of course we can make the world better. And, and you don't have to have money to do it. If, you, if you're walking down the street and you see a can or a bottle or a piece of trash and you pick it up and carry it and put it in the wastebasket like I do, you're making the world a little better right then. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. I'm Anna, uh, master student of international relations. I would like to know, from your point of view, what are the perspectives of U.S.-Russia relations, and what is the best way of cooperation between our two nations? What do I think of the of, the, of Russian uh, U.S. relations? I think uh, we need need more contact than we're, than we're getting. We need opportunities to be, to be friends more. So it, it, if you have an opportunity to uh, go study in the United States on an exchange student program, I would strongly recommend you do it. And I would recommend to students in America to come over here and study, too. That's one thing that uh, we can do. But any kind of uh, contact is uh, is good. Cultural exchanges, uh, art, uh, music, uh, sports. And I, I'm really sorry that they canceled the Goodwill Games. I would have, if, if it was me, I would have kept it going because it really did get a chance for a lot of uh, Russian athletes to get to know American athletes. And, and then it was on television in both our countries so everybody could see the, the uh, the athletes uh, getting along together and working together. It was really a good thing. So we need to work on as much contact as we possibly can. Uh, my name is Oksana, and uh, I'm, a student, I'm a second year student uh, at the Inter Institute of International Economic Relations. And my question is, you know, now there is a tendency of cooperation between Russia and America in the film industry. Like, there was a recent movie of James Bond with participation of both Russian and American actors. So the first question is, do you like it? And the second question is, would you like to try yourself as a director? Would it be fun for you? Thanks. Well, directing movies, yeah, I used to be in the movie business. I, I owned MGM at one time and New Line Cinema. I, I greenlit Lord of the Rings. You saw it, that very popular. Um, I, I, I think it's great. Uh, if, if Soviet filmmakers are working with American uh, filmmakers. And as far as me directing, I don't, I, I don't have time. I'm 70 years old. If I'm going to help get rid of nuclear weapons and get us uh, to stop burning coal and switch over to natural gas and, and uh, solar and wind, I have to work on that full time. I'd rather direct movies, though. That's fine. <laughs> 
Uh, hello, Ted. Uh, my name is Veronica. I'm a junior at the uh, International Institution of um, uh, Government Administration. Uh, so this morning you were talking about uh, the fact that we should uh, help those who are less fortunate than we are and um, uh, speaking about the countries, such as maybe some African or Asian countries, I do support this uh, viewpoint. Uh, but do you think this is the only way uh, that we can um, uh, establish uh, economical and political stability? Uh, because we know that um, uh, one of the major causes of political, economical, different types of instability is the gap between the rich and the poor. And do you think there should be some uh, politics, some policy on the international level to level out this uh, instability between the poor? It, should this be only the help to our uh, other countries? Thank you. Okay. Your, your point about north and south, rich and poor, so forth, the, the, the best way to uh, bridge that gap, for, as far as I can see, is to uh, work within the United Nations the way I did with that billion dollar uh, gift because that, that money goes from from the developed world to the developing world most of it does and, and to help out on projects like curing polio and measles and malaria in the developing world and the rights of, of, of women and young girls uh, to have equal rights with men and equal rights to education and so forth. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, Dan. My, my name is uh, Stanislav Moskvin. Uh, I'm a student of International Economic Relations, uh, Faculty of International Economic Relations. And, uh, you know, uh, nowadays we uh, have to be, we have to live uh, in progress, actually. And uh, uh, do you want, uh, do you plan to uh, change something in uh, CNN company to uh, to be uh, more powerful uh, nowadays. Thanks. I think CNN's doing a pretty, pretty good job over, over here, CNN International, but I'm no longer uh, associated with the, with the company. I got laid off about eight years ago, so I'm unemployed. <laughs> I, I, I still work, but I don't get paid by anybody. But that's okay, I, I can afford it. So I, but I really don't, uh, I don't run CNN anymore. Hi, Ted. Uh, my name is Osim, a second year student of the National Economic Relations Faculty. And uh, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, policy of the government of the United States of America. We, know it's, we all know that the former administration and the president of the U.S., uh, we know the invasion to Iraq, and uh, they still uh, had their own, their own purposes. Uh, they followed their own interests and uh, did these things, invaded Iraq. What do you, how do you see the present administration and the president of uh, the United States? Do they still, I mean, are they still doing uh, these uh, things, following their own personal interests? I, I certainly uh, like the Obama administration a lot better than the Bush administration. And, and I was against uh, the war in Iraq to start with. I'm against war, period. I can't think of anything that, any circumstances that wars have helped. That they just make things worse, and uh, in my opinion. So I, I was against it, and I'm, the sooner it's over, the better, and hopefully this will be the last one. Uh, but I'm only one person, and uh, I'd like to think that all countries, I know everybody is inclined to act in their own best personal interest, but I can make an argument that your best personal interest is what's best for everybody, is best for you too, rather than what's best for you is not good for everybody. You know, that's, that's not a very uh, happy circumstance. If that was the way the world was, then that wouldn't be a very nice place to live. Uh, could you tell us more about your charity activities? Well, I have, uh, I'm involved with, uh, with, with, with four uh, major foundations. The biggest one is the uh, United Nations Foundation that works with the United Nations uh, in various areas, in, in most of, 
to some degree in, 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 in most of the major areas, Ch children's health, uh, women and girls, uh, peace and security. Okay, that's, that's the, the, uh, the United Nations Foundation. The second largest foundation is the uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative. And uh, uh, we have two board members from, uh, from Russia and, uh, and, and, and most of the other nuclear countries. They're not government officials. They're uh, NGO-type people. Uh, and, and that foundation is the one that works to get rid of weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. And then the third foundation is a family foundation. It's called the Turner Foundation. And it works mainly with environmental things, uh, all, all kinds of environmental organizations we give money to in the United States primarily, but sometimes in other, in other parts of the world. We've, we've given some money uh, over the years, quite a bit actually, to save the wild salmon in Kamchatka and eat the far east of Russia, where the salmon come up the rivers to spawn and then go back out into the ocean. It's a very important food source for the Russian people that live out there, and I, I think they probably ship those salmon all over the all over the country, don't they? You can get salmon in any restaurant in in Russia, can't you? But, so those those are the three three main ones, and then the other one is the Captain Planet Foundation, which works with children to get them to uh, plant uh, gardens and learn how to how to how to grow grow things. Good morning, Ted. I'm Molchan of Nick, uh, the second course of uh, International Economic Relations. I have a personal question, not about your work or something like that. I'm just interested in whether you listen to music, and uh, if so, what music you like? My music. I really, I, I, I like music, uh, music a lot. And I used to be in the music business. Warner Music was uh, part of Time Warner. They sold, sold it. Uh, but, but I like music, but I, I kind of like uh, mood, mood music, romantic music. I'm not much of a rapper or, uh, you know, the hip hop type stuff. I'm a little too old for that. I like Frank Sinatra, you know, John Denver. Okay? Yeah, sure, the young people like Frank Sinatra also. They do. <laughs> Please. Uh, hi, Ted. My name is Alex. I'm the fourth year student. And uh, the qu my question is, uh, was the crisis uh, completely unexpected for you? And uh, which country will be the first, up to your opinion, to recover? Well, first of all, uh, I'm not an economist. I, I wish I was, but I'm not. And um, I, I, I did not see the crisis, but I did know that um, in America, where I've spent most of my time, that the people were spending too much money and not saving enough money and borrowing too much money. And, and that uh, was, I think, the main reason for the crisis, that people were, and, and the banks, and everybody got, uh, was lending too much money and borrowing too much money and, and spending money they didn't have. It's one thing I've always done, is I've always spent less than I had. That's how you get rich. You don't get rich by spending more than you make. That's not, that, that, that I do know, you know, you don't have to go to college to know that, right? <laughs> anyway, if you spend all your money and you borrow 100 ruples and spend it too, you're gonna be in more trouble than if you save the 100 ruples, you know, you can always buy something later. So anyway, that takes care of that. And I don't know which country's going to get out of it first. I mean. It, the, 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 I, I think we're making a big mistake using GDP, you know, the, as, as, a, as a, uh, a measure of whether a country's doing well or not. The reason is that GDP, the one big fallacy, is that it doesn't debit the environmental degradation that's done. So it looks like you're making a lot of money, but it's at the cost of uh, destroying the environment. And that, that's going to the greatest cost of all. A perfect example was there's a country in Africa called Ivory Coast. Everybody's heard of it. Nobody can find it on the map, but, but it's a small country. But they had a, a big rainforest there, very beautiful trees. And about 50 years ago, 
the president of the country said, we're going to cut those trees down and get the GDP. And they, they, they started cutting their trees. And they made a lot of money. And their GDP was one of the highest in the developing world as a percentage of income. But after 20 years of cutting the trees, guess what happened? There were no trees left. So the economy just crashed. <laughs> I mean, that is about the dumbest thing in the world. And, and accounting firms, you know, if, if there's anybody here that goes into accounting, you, you can't overstate. That's what happened with uh, AOL and Time Warner. AOL was cooking the books and making it look like they had more income than they did. And, and as a result of that, we paid them too much for the company, but they, and then we ended up almost going to jail. Not me, because I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't know about it. But, uh, but, but you just, you, you've got to keep rules, uh, your accounting rules have to make sense and be logical and, and take, take everything into consideration. But this GDP thing is a bunch of BS. Just because China, it sounds like China's got an eight point something, 8.7 GDP in the third quarter. I think that's what it was. But if you go there, the air, you can't even breathe. The people are choking to death in, in, in the cities of China because of all the coal burning plants and so, so much of it. And now they're getting lots of automobiles too, and so it's adding to the problem. So we've got to uh, straighten out the scorekeeping better and, and, uh, and, 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 and do an honest job of accounting. My name is Alexey Gorenov. I represent the United Nations Association of St. Petersburg, the Committee of Global Health. And I have a question uh, for you. Uh, you have found uh, several uh, funds dealing with ecological and environmental problems, healthcare problems. Do you believe that in the future the healthcare challenges may become more important than political political? They could. I hope they. I hope they don't. You know that would be. But 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 probably. I mean, they're both two big areas. I mean, I think you need to have good politics and good health care. You know, I mean, if they have good politics and bad health care, or good health care and bad politics, that wouldn't be very good either. I, that's one of the tricky things that I work with the United Nations, because the United Nations is working with almost every area of, of, of the human existence to make it better. Because I think we need to take care of, take care of it all. That's why I say it's, it's what we've got to, we got to start doing the smart things and stop doing the dumb things and all of the smart things. We have to well, take care of our health. We have to do, do all these things that we've been talking about because if you just do one or two of them and don't do the others, you know, it's not going to make any sense. Thank you. Uh, let's first, the far then you. Hi, Ted. My name is Dasha, and I wanted to ask one thing. We all know that community service is quite popular and widespread in America, while in Russia it's not that common. So how do you think, how could we promote it here? Thank you. Once again, please. We all know that community service in America is quite popular, while in Russia it's not that common. So how do you think, how could we promote it here? How, how can we promote health? Community service. Right, volu volunteering. Volunteering. Well, that's what I'm here trying to do. That's, that's wonderful. I mean... How we can promote. Right. Just promote it. Just promote it. That, that's about all you can do. Thank you. Hello, Ted. My name is Marika Zakdanska. I come from Slovak Republic. I represent the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovak Republic. And my question is, uh, in your life, do you consider yourself to be more diplomatic or more straightforward? And uh, what kind of diplomacy uh, do you find the most useful to make our life better? Thank you. I'd say I'm diplomatic and I try to be diplomatic and I try to be straightforward. And I don't think that the two will compete with one another. I think it's okay to, to have both. Yes. Was that the, was that yes. any more? Yes, no more. Okay, what about that gentleman up there? Yeah, good morning, Ted. Uh, my name is Andrew, um, International Relations Faculty, Fast Goals. Uh, I'm from Belarus, and uh, my question uh, is connected with freedom of speech. Uh, do you agree with the statement uh, that uh, all the mass media must be more responsible for the information uh, they represent 
uh, because the consequences of their activity sometimes are uh, unexpected and moreover surprising. Thank you. But I agree with you. I think it would be nice to have as much freedom of the press as we can. As long as the press operates, uh, fair, the, the one thing the press has got to do is they've got to be responsible, too. You know, like, if, if, if somebody hires out fire in here, in this crowded room, uh, they might be giving information, but, uh, but, but if there's no fire, you know, that's not, that's not good. That's, that, that's the one area where, where freedom of the press should possibly have some limits, mm. in my opinion. Thank you. And you're from Belarus. Yes. That used to be part of the Soviet Union. Uh, former, right. but, uh, from, former, but we are independent now. I, I know that. I've been there. <laughs> uh, good morning, Ted. My name is Jane. I am a, sec a third year student at the Faculty of International Economic Relations. And my question here is, uh, what do you think about the bilateral presidential commission founded uh, by our presidents in July? And uh, the second question is, uh, what do you think about the Nobel Peace Prize being awarded to President Obama? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I, I really don't know much about the bilateral commission that was established in July. Uh, as far as the Nobel Peace Prize is concerned, I think that Obama got that because uh, the, the, the people on the committee liked his position uh, of, of, of multilateralism, of, of supporting the United Nations, of getting rid of nuclear weapons, and, and they wanted to give him and everyone else that works on that, that, those areas some encouragement uh, that we should, we're on the right track and we should stick with it. And that's what we're going to do, I hope. Uh, hello, Ted. And I, a student, I'm a first year student from the Faculty of International Journalism. My name is Michael. And I wanted to ask you, imagine you could time travel. What would you change in the past, or what would you like to see in the future? Thank you. I've tried to. Uh, I'd, I'd like to go into the future and take a look, and I'd like to go back in the past. I'd like to go back and meet Peter the Great. He was quite tall, you know. <laughs> but but I don't I don't really believe in it. I don't think I don't think it's going to work. But but if it does, I'll be happy and I'll sign up to be one of the first to go. I just want to be sure that I can come back <laughs> if I don't like it as much there as I do here. Good morning, Ted. My name is Daria. Just my second education in the uh, Institute here. So my question is, uh, having looked back and having this current live background and experience, what one thing you may desire to change? I don't know. I'd be a lot of things I'd change in the past. Uh, because I want to see everybody be nice to each other. And back in the past, people weren't as nice as they are today, I don't think. I think, I think we're nicer today than we ever were. For instance, uh, we've done away with slavery. And, 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 and 100 years ago, all the women in the world didn't have equal rights with men. And now, over half the women in the world have equal, equal rights with men. And uh, 100 years ago, maybe 20% of the people in the world could read and write, and now 80% can. So we've made, we've, made a lot of, we've made a lot of progress. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to, to see us make a lot more. We can. All we have to do is start doing the smart things. Stop doing the dumb things. Good morning, Ted. I'm here. Uh, uh, well, my question is, uh, where, or in what university have you started, and uh, have you ever needed your higher education to earn a million? I went to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, in the United States, and. Uh, 
Uh, I graduated when I was about 50. They gave me my degree, but I didn't graduate with the class. Um, I don't think it's necessary to, for you to have a college degree to make a lot of money. Look at Bill Gates. He's the richest man in the world, and he only went to Harvard for one year. Now, that wouldn't work for everybody. I think stay in college. I, my, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't absolutely have to. Uh, hello, Ted. My name is Sonia, and I study journalism. I want to ask you uh, what American people think about Russian people, and do they... <laughs> Those that know Russian people like them, yep. you know, mostly, but not enough Russian people know American people and vice versa. But uh, hopefully we can change that. And the second question is, uh, do American people really think that they have won uh, the Second World War? Do the American people think they won the Second World War? Yes. I think we all won it together. You know. And we'd have to have a survey because some Americans might think they did more than others. but. But uh, it was a joint, joint effort. And actually, in my opinion, having studied World War II very carefully over a long period of time, I think it was the Russians that were mostly responsible for winning World War II. You crushed the Nazi beast at Stalingrad. <laughs> <laughs> so we're finishing. And uh, one, qu one question, last one. Hello, Ted. My name is Vlad. Um, you made a great contribution to uh, our to making our country's uh, relationship more stable and uh, uh, healthy, and so on. And uh, I think uh, so. You had a brilliant idea, and you made it real. I think there are dozens of people here who uh, have their own ideas. So could you give us some tips, some advices on how to make uh, them real? Hey, I've, I've said that before already. Get to get to know each other better uh, and, and make friends in the United States when you get a chance. Go there on holiday if you can afford to, or if you run into some Americans that are coming over here, be nice to them, invite them over for dinner or something, get to know them a little bit. Take them out for a vodka, but don't, don't get them to drink too much. So let's finish at this point. So I know that a lot of questions can be raised again, but so uh, let we thank uh, Ted to find the time to meet with uh, students of Gimo University and other Moscow universities and the uh, activist of UN Association Youth Group. So thank you a lot uh, that you traveled quite far, quite often. And uh, thank you a lot for the support in the United Nations once again. Because and thank you all for being here.